everyone, my name is Mel Boris, and my lovely performers here, Felix Schwab, Sam Lind, and Sam Jones with the warming Nocturne by Adam Rapp. We have some mentions of death and gun use if that makes you uncomfortable. Feel free to excuse yourself. Thank you. Fifteen years ago, I killed my sister. There. I said. I can change the order of the words. My sister I killed fifteen years ago. I, fifteen years ago, killed my sister. I, my sister, fifteen years ago, I killed. I can cite various definitions to deprive of life. The farmer killed the rabbit dog. To put an end to. The umpire killed the tennis match. To mark for omission. He killed the paragraph. To cause extreme pain to. His monologue killed the audience. Fifteen years ago, I killed my sister. It's dumb sounding, the way most facts are, like former presidents or the names of bones. Grover Cleveland, Fibula, Tibia, Beamer. There's a finality to the fact, something medical almost. A fact is crafted, vaguely industrial. It has permanence. It's a stain or a smudge, a botch or a spot or a blemish. A fact is a flaw. You can look at the back of your hand and know exactly how the bones moved. Fifteen years ago, I killed my sister. I was seventeen. She was nine. A fact. Now I'm thirty-two. She would be twenty-four. Fact. The hip bone's connected to the leg bone. The accident happens like this. Julia, Illinois. I'm driving home from work. Work. I'm, ha I'm heading back. I'm heading west on Black Road. I'm going 45 and a 30. At least that's what the speedometer freezes after the collision. I like to call it a collision because decapitation sounds somehow capital, corporeal. So it's 7:30. The sun is a flaming orb on the horizon. The sky is filled with colors, reds, pinks, burnt oranges, clouds like frayed gauze. Their underbelly is golden somehow. I accelerate. Something smaller is out into the road. I break. Nothing happens. It's a, it's a dog or a trash can or a bag that's caught wind. I keep pumping the brakes, but nothing happens. I might as well be pumping a bologna sandwich. I swerve. There's a thud, a hollow, almost wooden thud, small as an egg. I keep pumping the brakes. I swerve, I counter swerve, I crash into a large oak tree at the end of the street. The front end of the electro accordions into the windshield. There are birds everywhere, a schizophrenic cloud of crows. In that post-crash ethereal silence, I get out of my car and walk a hundred yards or so back to where I heard the thud. My legs take me. The hip bone is connected to the leg bone. I see my sister's body in the street. It looks like a doll's body. Legs. Feet. Yellow socks, perfectly folded. Bits of Lace turned down, <laughs> my mother's touch. Shoes so small it looks like they came out of a children's fable. Hands, arms, neck. Her head is across the street. I walk over to pick it up. 
simply, as if it were a ball or a fugitive picnic toy. I, I will reattach it to the neck and she will rise off the pavement and go back to the house and wash up for supper. As I'm reattaching, my mother can be seen framed in the living room window. Her hand pressed against the glass, her head tilted slightly as though she's peering out over a strange body of water. As though she's watching something hellish emerge from the fog. The sound of silence. Shrieking from all directions. The shrieking turns into a kind of weeping. She swam. She rode her bike. She liked to wear boys clothes. She would steal my boxes and wear them to swimming practice. <laughs> Once at dinner, she ambitiously announced her plan of owning a tuxedo. She intended to wear it to her fourth grade graduation. She would imitate dogs. She would get down on all fours and howl at the siren from a distant fire truck. She called me. Dorcas. <laughs> So the memories are here. As clear as if they happened yesterday. I just can't see her face. The evening of my sister's death, it was discovered that the brake line in the electra had snapped. My mother says. They're going to let you off with involuntary manslaughter. The word man. The word slaughter. A fifty dollar fine. My mother says. Your father paid it for you. I say. Tell him thanks. She says. He's taking this very hard. We haven't spoken since I've been home. We pass each other in the kitchen like canoes in a lake with a silent Dumb inevitability. He says, Come on in, son. I've lost my name. He sits across from me at his hulking oak banker's desk, his hand flat against the blotter, his head tilted down almost shamefully. There's a small, snub nosed revolver set between the axes of his thumbs. It looks like a young blackbird sleeping. I have never seen this gun before. I had no idea there was a small black gun in our small blonde house. I say, is that a gun? He doesn't respond. Instead, he kind of clucks, as though his Adam's apple has been replaced with a peach stone and all future attempts at swallowing will be accompanied by this hollow wooden effect. The heat of the room curls your eyelashes. My father's fury has a stench like undercooked pork. Cold undercooked pork. He says, don't move. As if there's just a wasp on my shoulder. My father sees his skin a flat, dull pink, and I don't recognize myself in him. I see nothing of his only son in this strange, violent intimacy. The wide nose, the smaller, tangular scar below his bottom lip, the far spread eyes. For some reason, I have this thought that I am from a stork. I was birthed on the mountainside, flown to the suburbs by a mythological fowl, and dropped through the mouth of a chimney. I hear my mother's voice. Earl, put the gun down, Earl. Her voice is gentle with fatigue. Not this way, honey. It's as if she's coaxing a child out of a tree. Play for us, son. Play while your mother clears the table. He would 
remove it, and my mother would throw it in the trash, somehow rendering the thing powerless. I would eventually lift myself off that chair and walk out of our small, ho small home on, Black on Gale Drive. My ribs in flames. I would lurch, slouch, spy over the bus stop. My legs moving themselves as though some kind of imperfect homemade ratchet wrench. The bus would take me to the train station. I take Amtrak as far east as it'll go. Grand Central Station. Commuters and merchants and runways all colliding in an electron bombardment. A cathedral of noise, so many suits. Anonymity. Here is where I would begin my 15-year disappearance from that small blonde house on Gale Drive. I would walk out on 42nd Street with $12.42 in my pocket, the hip bones connected to the leg bone. <laughs> 